EV, IV. So thank you very much for joining us today. And like I was saying before we started recording, uh, in this podcast, we are like uh, two in the coffee bar. In front of us is a coffee, so we are just talking. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi A14. And I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. How is uh, where you are today, Bristol? That's where you are talking to me just now, no? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about yeah. your location. So Bristol is, you know, it's a city in, in, in the United Kingdom. It is in the southwest of the country. And it is quite cosmopolitan. I think that is one of the things that I really like about it. It's quite mixed. You've got a fair mix of different ethnic groups kind of represented in Bristol. So yeah, that is, you know, that's one of the things that I like about it. And of course, you've got things like uh, the suspension bridge, you've got um, SS Great Britain, which are iconic sites that if anyone wanted to come around and visit, you know, those are really good places to go to. Um, yeah, so I quite like Bristol. Now tell us something about you. Tell us a little introduction about you for the person that is seeing you for the first time. What would you like to say about yourself? <laughs> you see, that that is a, that is a uh, quite a question because I always say to people that you know, tell me about you without saying anything about your job, <laughs> about your family, and you know, which is it's quite difficult to, for people to talk about themselves without including their family, their jobs, or what they do and all of that. But um, for me, like I said, my name is Ivy and I am a mom first. I'm gonna talk about my family, I'm a mom and um, I, I love to connect with people. I, I am a very jovial and, you know, talkative and laughing person yet very quiet as well so it's it, it's a bit of a mix there but I love to connect with people I yeah I, I feel a lot of empathy for people and I've got an empathetic heart so yeah that's me this podcast actually this the, the tagline you will see on that is um, everyone has a story to share by that mm. I mean that we are really concentrating on the people that we bring to this um to these episodes so we're going to spend some time talking about you as you were growing up. So tell us, where were you born? Tell us about your childhood. I want to know the little Ivy just growing up. Oh my God. Tell you what, that little girl is still in there and she's still very much alive. So I was born in Cameroon. Cameroon is a country in the West Africa, in the West of Africa. And I was born in the northwest region of Cameroon. It is um, a country that is so diverse in terms of its population and in terms of its um, its landscape as well. So in the north of the country, you have like Sahel, really dry desert conditions. Southwest of the country, which is part of where I come from, you've got you've got like the um, rainforest, and then you've got the 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 like the um highlands in the in the east of the country so it's it's a very diverse country in terms of the climate and in terms of the landscape as well but the little girl ivy oh she was a bobbly girl or she is still a bobbly girl because she's <laughs> she's in there she's she's right in there she's not going anywhere see, we can see <laughs> yeah <laughs> she's still right in there very playful loves loves to climb trees. I used to climb a lot of trees in my childhood. I had a very, very happy upbringing, a very happy childhood wherein I was loved. I was surrounded by a lot of love. And uh, from my siblings and from my parents and from uncles and aunties, you know how it is in Africa, families are quite big and quite joyful. And, you know, there was a time when we were about 15 of us in the same household and compounds are quite big as well we used to call them compounds not houses even because within a compound you have many people living there so that was me growing up I went to school mainly in Cameroon 
um, before immigrating to the UK, where I carried on schooling and eventually uh, working as well. So that's interesting. So Cameroon, you are from you are from my neighborhood then. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I am probably your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm so passionate about Cameroon because uh, one, uh, there are a lot of interesting things about Cameroon. Also because I have a lot of friends from Cameroon also in the city where I live. Oh. Uh, some of my best friends are from Cameroon, so we talk a lot oh, about nice. Cameroon uh, often. Uh, in fact, I interviewed an anthropologist from Cameroon recently, okay. and we, oh, dig, that's interesting. we dig a little bit about also African history and a bit also about Cameroon uh, for the peculiarity of the Cameroonian democracy. I promise mm. we are not touching it today. That is not part of our No, at all. <laughs> it's just to let <laughs> you know that uh, on Cameroon, we love it. We share about it continuously. So, yeah. So tell me, what is it that you miss? Is there if anything from your home country? Because you are in the UK, but originally you are from Cameroon. Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. I miss especially the food. Oh, the food. The food in Cameroon is... Honestly, you would agree with me that, you know, Nigeria is not, you know, the food in Nigeria is not as diverse compared to Cameroon. The food in Cameroon is so diverse and I do miss that food. But then I also miss, there is, there is something about, about you growing up in a place. And I, I suppose everyone misses this about their home or the place that they identify most with as home. I miss that air of just being at home. I miss my family, of course, but then that is part of that air of being at home. I miss the people. I miss the food. The food in particular is honestly, yeah. That's interesting. All right, now, Ivy, tell me uh, your journey to Europe because um, mm -hmm. you were born in Cameroon. Naturally, you will live in Cameroon. But of course, we are not always natural in some, some cases because we, sometimes we, we want to double into what is out there because we need to be sometimes explore the curiosity that is the curiosity that we have inside. Huh? So for one reason or the other, we just do not remember where we are born. And this is not good or bad. It's just the way it is. So tell me, yeah. um, tell me about your journey or tell me actually about your destination, Europe. Um, I think, first of all, I love traveling, by the way. That is something that um, I love traveling and change the idea of changing locations and traveling. Just that, that experience that you go through from going from one place to another. For me, I love that challenge. I love experiencing new cultures. So moving to Europe for me was not, I think for me, it, it was, First of all, it was a natural transition because my husband was here anyways. So in order for us to stay together as a family, it was natural for me to, to move to Europe. But also, it's that part of me that loves to travel and experience and have new experiences. And, you know, I, I often say that I would love to travel the world and just visit different countries and different cultures. And so it's that love for experiencing different cultures, but also fueled by the fact that my husband was here already and it was just natural for me to to, to move and then live with him. Yeah. That's that's very, very interesting. But that is one of the reasons a lot of African um, women are in Europe, no? Of course, when you make a family, you need to be together, no? So if your husband yeah. is, is, uh, is in America, you are going to have to get it. It's only a question of time. And of course, mm. it, there is a lot of interest in the, uh, around it, no? So a lot of things change. Then, you know, it's a beautiful... <laughs> we are in a journey, and I like the fact that we are in a journey, and it's a very beautiful one. But before we yeah. uh, we come to your project just now, which is very uh, fascinating, uh, mm -hmm. when you were still much younger, what was your old trajectory? How were you see yourself in the future? I mean, how were you sort of imagining yourself as an adult, now you are still a baby. Um, I think I've always been the type of person who loves adventure anyways. So I love an adventure, I love a challenge. 
and I'm not saying that anyone should come and challenge me. Anyway, you have your challenge, you bring it on. But I love a challenge. <laughs> I'm going to okay? challenge you. <laughs> I'm yeah, please do. I love a challenge. And for me, growing up, I'd always wanted a challenge. Any life that is challenging and exciting and has, you know, and has some excite some level, some level of excitement, but yet some level of challenge. And also, I love studying. I love to learn. So for me, it was always I wanted to be in a space where I could learn and grow in terms of my knowledge of, you know, my, my intellect, but also in, in other aspects, like grow emotionally, grow physically, you know. So when I was a kid, I'd always, always wanted to help people in terms of working as maybe in, 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 in a medical setting. So like I can remember as far, far back as when I was five, I thought, okay, I really want to work as a medical doctor. <laughs> that that was what I'd always, you know, as a, as a child growing up wanted to do. But then I think it is not just the idea of being a medical doctor that fascinated me. It was the idea of helping people and the idea of having that excitement of being in that space where I can help people. All right. That is where you go. And that is where we are going to start from just now. This is your idea of helping people. This project that you are currently working on, that I said before, that is fascinating for the idea that you have to think about other people. It's not very, uh, it's not something that we need to disregard. It's very, very important. So tell us about this project and how it started. So um, in terms of, I wouldn't really call it a project as such. I'll call it, I don't know what I'll call it, but I, so, the long and short of it is I want to help people. And at some point in time, far back, say as far back as 2018, um, I started training to become a life coach. And um, I think it was inspired by my own difficulties that I faced, especially when I moved out to the West, when I, when I kind of immigrated to the West, but also, I realized that in my quest, in my search for, for knowledge, there were things that I really did not understand about, especially about myself. It was like I was starting to rediscover myself. And it was like, at some point growing up, I stopped being myself and I started being whatever the society had conditioned me to be. And so it was like a rebirth for me for going back to factory settings and how it came about i don't know i think it was just my love for, for helping people that led me into coaching quite naturally so coaching for me is that space where i get to know me where i get to harness those those skills that are within me that are not yet being used yet where i get to tap into that potential and bring it to light where I just get to show up as me and be authentic and not have to you know take on the persona of someone else or start to seek for the approval of other people and for me I saw that life as a life that was more beneficial it gave me more joy let me say so because ultimately what we as humans want is to be happy we want joy in our lives whatever we're looking out for all we want is joy and fulfillment. And I, I found that in coaching. So quite naturally, I went into it. Thank you for that. All right. Now, you're going to help us understand something because, of course, you are working in this area now. You are a life coach. Of course, we're going to also come to a life coach just now because you need to help us understand what it, that even means. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. let's uh, remain with you just a moment because you, okay, from your story, you came to join your husband in the UK. Uh, yep. Then, of course, in your in your latest explanation, uh, you have some challenges which also sort of led to what you are currently working on today, the project. Can you share with us what are, what are these challenges that you are referring to? So, even before moving to the UK, I was a science, I was a chemistry teacher. Okay, back in Cameroon, I was a chemistry teacher. I am still a chemistry teacher now. I still teach here in the UK, and um, 
besides being a chemistry teacher, there are certain aspects in life that I realized that I was struggling with. And some of these challenges were things like, you know, communication, understanding people, understanding how to communicate, understanding people on a deeper level such that you can effectively work with them. And within the workspace, you would agree with me that moving from a diff one country to another, it doesn't matter where you move from. And two, culturally, there are differences. There are differences in culture. There are differences in mindset. There are differences in mentality, in the way that people do things, even in the way that people speak. And one of the challenges is when I moved to the UK, for me, it was like a totally different culture. I did not know what I was expecting to find, but it was different from what I had envisaged it to be. And as a result of that difference in culture, I struggled to, you know, to carry on with my job as a teacher and work to the best of my ability. And also, you know, I would not, I would not downplay the fact that growing up as a child, we had this image of what the white man's land is, if I can call it that even. OK, because that's what, you know, we grew up back home being, being, you know, being we had we had th that conditioning. We had our own image in our heads. And then to come here and find it completely different from the image that I had built in my head. It can mess you up. It can make you start to doubt yourself. It can make you start to think that, oh, I'm not good enough here. I'm not good enough there. Let me give you one classic example. Now, children are children. It doesn't matter where they are. Children have similar characteristics about them. If they can get away with something, they will do everything to get away with it. Now, when I came to the UK, uh, class sizes are much, much smaller than in Cameroon. In Cameroon, when I asked my students to sit down and listen, straight away, they sat down, listened. But in the UK, it was not necessarily the case. And I struggled to deal with that. I did not know how to deal with that because culturally, I'd come from a place where students sat down and got on with it to a place where you ask students to sit down and instead they are sourcing you out to think to see whether you are strict enough, you are going to follow up on that word and all of that. So as a consequence of the changing culture, that massive shift in, in, in moving from Cameroon to here, I started to struggle. And I've realized that it is the same for so many people of color who immigrate to, 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 to the West. It's not just the UK. In particular, it is the same for, let me just say, it's the same for many people of color who immigrate to the West. And because of that, we lose our confidence, we lose our self-esteem, and it comes across, if I lose my confidence and my self-esteem, it comes across in my work. It affects my work, it affects my interactions with other people. And therefore, I cannot work again to the best of my ability because I don't even trust myself to do it. I don't even believe in my own ability to do it. Yet, asking other people to believe in me. And as a result, my work started to suffer. But when I started searching, because like I said, I love to learn. I love to understand things. I started the search. I was like, as an excellent teacher in Cameroon, I know the subject knowledge. I know it like the, the back of my hand. Why am I struggling? What is it that is making me to struggle? Is it because I don't know my subject matter? No, absolutely not. It was because of that shift culturally on the outside, which I had not made connection with that shift in my mind. And therefore, it was a mindset issue. It wasn't even a physical issue. And as a result of going through coaching, and then excelling in my job as a teacher and going on to become a leader, I thought, look here, there's something that we're not, we're not, we're not harnessing. We've got potential, but we're not harnessing that potential to become the best versions of ourselves. And that is where coaching came in for me. That is the situation for many people, uh, many Africans who have come to Europe. In fact, your case is civil different in that uh, in the course of my research about the presence of Africa in Northern Italy for, for so many years, 
Mm -hmm. I have come to understand a lot of uh, Africans who have um, who have be teacher like you. They come to mm -hmm. Italy, but they have never been able to carry on with their teaching. Your mm -hmm. qualification, absolutely. Is, your qualification is just worthless. Mm -hmm. So that becomes very challenging for them. Uh, so that somebody who has been a teacher all her life and want to teach, but you just enter into another country, you cannot teach, even though you are a teacher, you are not. You are not considered as qualified to teach as a teacher. So, exactly. so in that case, you are even going to help me. How did you manage to? Uh, okay, I know you are in UK. That is a different country compared to some other countries in Europe. But in which case, how did it work for you? Was it that you needed to be requalified, or did you have to go to another program before you could teach? Or tell us about that. I think it's it's not really different in the UK as such. Uh, because you come in, there are several routes that you can get into teaching in the UK, one of which you can come in and do uh, a, a postgraduate certificate in education, which is called PGCE, and then get into teaching. Another route, you can come in as a teacher and bring your qualification from outside the UK, get it acknowledged, get it recognized by a, a, a UK body, and then you can find a job and attach yourself to a university and be teaching whilst also attending lectures. So there are several ways to get in. But I think um, whether you're getting in through PGCE or through Teach First or whatever method, I think it boils back down to us as individuals, Africans who've emigrated into Europe. Because we emigrate, we bring our certificates, which are valid by, by, by every means. They are valid. We then need to follow a process. Now, as an African in a different country, that country has its, its policies. It has its set rules. Sometimes we are not confident enough to follow those set rules. Sometimes there's a lack of patience to follow those set rules. And I know that some people are going to tell me that obviously, you know, there are um, um, there's discrimination and there are all of these things. Yes, there is. We're not we're not we're not discounting that there isn't. However, on a fundamental level, I would say there are still many Africans, and it's not everyone. There are still many Africans who emigrate to the West, and they lack confidence in their own ability, and as a result of that lack of confidence. They give up and they stay mediocre. And I know that this may sound a bit harsh, but even if someone is discriminating against you, you still have the full responsibility to take ownership of your own life and pursue that life to the best of your ability. If you cannot take ownership of that life and pursue it, then you're letting only your own self down. And how do I take ownership of that life? I sit down, I analyze what is it that I am lacking in? Because I have sadly noticed that many of, or let me say some, not many, but some because I cannot put numbers on it. I can only talk about the people that I've interacted with. Many Africans that I've interacted with here in the West they have immense potential, but they don't believe in themselves enough to step up and step out and start putting that potential to use. I say so because there are always, even back in Africa, there are still things, there are still hoops and loops that we have to skip over. There are always going to be those systems that are put in place to hold people back. But what are you as an individual doing to overcome those systems and to be able to excel in whatever you want to do? That is a very important question. <laughs> it's a very important question. And of course, today we're today we're not going to be talking into uh the, the rules, the rules of the game, where that makes mm. us that make it challenging for us, no? Because we mm. are playing in another man's rule. So it automatically becomes okay. Let me use the word that we are not supposed to continuously use. The the game is ringed against us because it is not yeah, your it game. Is. All right, it but is. like, like yeah. yes, like you have correctly said, uh, no matter what is the situation that is discrimination against you, that is a game, that is a rule that is changing continuously against you. 
you are going to mm-hmm. have to continue to fight to be able to to remain afloat because if you don't do it nobody's going to do it nobody be a, being a mediocre is not an excuse you must you must do it because look at you for example you are coming from Cameroon, probably where um french is the language of the day okay yeah. i know in, in Cameroon you also speak english but french is mostly the language of the day you know but you, mm-hmm. you come to uk and you understand that you need to speak english for example to be able to find your way around you just have no option you have to do it you have no option mm-hmm. so the question i want to ask you ivy is now like you like me like many of us that are in the mm-hmm. west we don't have any option of remaining mediocre but what are we really supposed to do how do we break down this yoke that are just in front of us so sometimes they are put in place for us to slow us down what are we supposed to do in order to free our mission but we have a mission for coming here we didn't just wake up one day and just jump on the road to get to get to europe <laughs> there is there is a dream we want to fulfill how do we do yeah. it despite all the odds um i, I don't think there's any clear-cut answer to be honest <laughs> i don't think there's any clear-cut answer but there is i often say that as an ambitious person you have to take ownership of your life and when i say ownership of your life this may sound really simple but taking ownership of your life is not as simple as it sounds it means you have to take ownership of you have to acknowledge that i am fully responsible for all of the failures and all of the successes i own them I am going to assess my life. I am going to see where this life is going and I'm going to draw plans, put things into place. The way I say it, I say you have to become a self-leader. What does being a self-leader mean? It means that, first of all, I go fundamentally back to who am I as an individual? What are my values? What are my core values? What are my points of power? What are my, my, my strengths and my weaknesses? Much as weaknesses may sound like something that is bad, it isn't. Because if I know my strengths and my weaknesses, I can capitalize on my strengths and I can work on my weaknesses. That once I know my values, I can know that my values lend me to doing A, I know that. I can use my point of power to get what I definitely need. If I know that my point of power is communication, I can use, how are you using that communication to your advantage? Are you in a job where you are just being seen and not being heard, whereas your point of power is communication? Then part of being a self-leader is self-acceptance accepting that yes i'm a human being i have strengths and i have weaknesses and those flaws those weaknesses maybe i did not finish my education maybe that is a weakness that's holding me back now or maybe that is something that's holding me back so do i need to go back into school to finish that education then maybe another weakness of mine is i tend to you know flare up in anger when i am at work And therefore, I lose my job even before I've started the job. So three weeks in, I'm losing a job because maybe I fled up in anger. I was told that I was confrontational. Then that is a weakness. And I need to do that self-assessment continuously, which is one thing that as Africans, it is not in our culture, but the, the world is constantly evolving and we need to start assessing ourselves. Then I need to also be able to self manage. Self-management is not just about managing my resources, but it's about managing my finances as well. Why do I need a new car when I can barely feed, uh, feed myself? Why do I need maybe a new, a new handbag, which cost me a thousand pounds when I can barely pay my bills? So I need to be able to manage my finances well. It is also about managing my resources and looking at you know, yes, I, my, my, my brother in Africa maybe needs a thousand pounds. Instead of me slogging it 
and working and sending that thousand pounds, what do they need it for? Do they need it for a business? Have they shown me a business plan? And if they've shown me a business plan, is that business plan convincing enough for me to send them a thousand pounds? And I know that as Africans, we're probably, someone will probably think and say, oh, you're bringing that your, your Western thing here. But what is it as Africans that we need to learn so that we can start to progress as people and as, you know, a continent? Are you, if someone calls you up and tells you, oh, you know, um, uncle did this and that, uncle's house has done this and that, and we need to support with a hundred pounds each. Okay, so I haven't got a hundred pounds. Can I support you with 50 pounds? Because instead of a hundred, I'm going to give you 50 because I need to pay my bills as well. So it's about constantly analyzing. Also, if you set up a business back home and you take your, your family and put there, are they working for the betterment of that business? Is that business going the way that you want it to go? And if not, are you happy to sack your family members of that business and employ people who actually do it? So we need a total, a total. And I cannot say this with, you know, I say this with so much passion because we need a total 360 mindset shift to start to evaluate the things that are working for us and the things that are not working and be ready to use, to, to, to embrace change so that we can change those things that are not working. And then finally, part of being a self-leader is self-growth. If you cannot grow as a person, and I, when I talk about self-growth, it spans across going to school, learning things that have absolutely nothing to do with your schooling, learning things like soft skills, like communication skills, like interpersonal skills, like emotional intelligence, uh, so many different soft skills, how to approach people, how to keep personnel in the work, in the workspace. Skills that have nothing to actually do with schooling. Skills that we were not taught in school. Skills that are useful day-to-day -day skills that we need. So I think that is, it's, it's quite a broad answer. And I know that it did not give, you know, like a seven-step formula to become, you know, successful in, in the West. But there is no seven-step formula. It just needs a mindset shift. And once that mindset shift comes, trust me, every other thing that you used to see as a problem, you now start seeing it as stepping stones to find solutions to the, to the things that you're facing, to the challenges that you're facing. It no longer becomes a problem. It becomes, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to plan like this. I'm going to plan like that. And I'm going to face this challenge that I'm facing. I don't know if it answers your question. Oh, but absolutely, that's what I've got. absolutely. We don't. Uh, I, I like. I like what you. We don't. We don't. We don't have a template here. We just. We, we are just organic. No, I think yeah. nature is organic. So we are just be organic here, and we are being real. And I think that is yeah. that is actually the thing that people want to hear. No, you don't want to be petting people now and be telling oh, them no. anything other than the truth. You need to tell them the truth. And, and that is really very important. You know, you may mention of a lot of important things, you know, talking of the soft skills that we were not taught, uh, taught in school. But at the economy that we are living in today, which is the service-based economy, is actually mm -hmm. based on soft skills. If Absolutely. you have a very important product, a good product even, and mm -hmm. you lack the communication, nobody will buy from you. Because no. it's no longer about the same. It's no longer about the, what you have is how do you render it? It's mm -hmm. about the customer service this time. The other day, yeah. I did a very important interview with, uh, with, a, with a lady in UK who wrote a book called Customer Service, about the poor customer service within our community. Because so that we yes. don't think that we have it, but we do have it. And mm -hmm. it's a lot. And it's killing us. That maybe, for example, yeah. you go into a so-called African shop, very filthy, dirty. Why do you have to do it like that? Why don't you look at the store next to you? Because yeah. You are in the UK. You are in, maybe in Italy. You are in Germany. You are in France. Look, you must be like the people in UK, in Italy, in Germany, or in France. You cannot, 
you cannot go around and start saying, I'm an Africa for this reason, my shop should be like that. No, it is not acceptable. Oh, no. No, it's not. An, being, having a filthy shop is not even an African thing because, you know, it's, it's not, there's nothing that relates filth to Africa. Absolutely nothing. So that person, and obviously, I, I would say, as a people, feedback is the one thing that we really struggle to take. And I've seen it with so many other people as well. So many people from so the people that I've interacted with. And when I say this, I keep saying that the people that I interact with are probably the people that I'm talking about. But then you would agree with me that if you walk into such a shop and tell the, the owner of that shop that, look, with, you know, could you do things differently? That person is probably not going to take it kindly that you told them that. Which is a shame because what you're giving is feedback. You're not attacking the person as such. And part of being that self-leader is about being able to receive feedback and realize that feedback is not an attack on me as such. It is talking about either my work or my service that I provide. And it's about sitting back and actually objectively Taking your emotions aside, is my shop filthy? That is another important question, you know, because all this thing that you're talking about, especially since the last question and also this one, have to do with skills that we really do need. We need it so much. But of we course, do. but unfortunately, these are not taught in school. Mm -hmm. Throughout, I think last year, in our uh, in the, in the podcast that is uh, which we dedicate to business, because we have actually more than one YouTube channel, but there is one uh, that is actually about business. We dedicated the entire year talking about soft skills because you are it's so important for us to survive today in the economy. Yeah. We need it. We can also see sometimes, okay, we're not going to talk about politics. Sometimes you have some of our politicians that are not able to communicate. Yeah. Because you have the power. I have nobody denying that. But are you able to communicate to the people that you are leading? Mm. Because it's very important. You you cannot just you cannot just double things around. You, you need to know exactly what you are doing, exactly Absolutely. what you are doing. Mm. And All I right. think it, it, it boils down to that idea of planning, isn't it? We ask, you know, if we can plan, if you ask maybe the politician, what is your five-year plan? And how do you plan on achieving this five-year roadmap? What is the roadmap to this five-year plan? You probably hear things like, you know, I want to build roads. I want to build schools. Okay, so when do you want to start building them? And that is the beauty of the work that I do, especially in terms of coaching, because I support people to get down to the nitty gritties of their plan. Now, the way that I... You know, I said I'm a life coach, but I call myself a mindset empowerment coach. And the reason it's really important because everything that we do, we achieve in life is based on me shifting my mindset. If I cannot shift my mindset and make those changes within, I'm not going to make those changes without. And so as part of planning and as part of, you know, achieving my targets i need to be able to strategically plan and it's not just a simple plan it's not just a list i need to be strategic in my planning and that means i need to consider the obstacles that i could face i need to consider who the support that i need to, to effect all of those plans that I'm, i've got i need to consider the obstacles that i could face within myself i need to consider my own strengths and my own weaknesses when it comes to that plan and who I can then bring in to support when I'm not able to do those things. I need to consider the benefits of those plans to me, to the people around me, to my career, to, to the people that I'm supporting. So it's not just about writing a five-year plan, but it's about taking so many other things into consideration, which then brings out that strategic planning. I need to consider when I'm starting, when I'm ending that project, I need to consider the rainy season because during the rains, if it's a road, 
I might not be building that road during the rainy season because it rains and washes away the tar or the topsoil or whatever. Those are things that I need to put into consideration and put them as part of my five-year planning. And then I need to look and see if actually I need to extend that from five to six years because of all of those obstacles that I'm going to be facing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. All right, now uh, let's uh, remain again on the on this immigration um, episode because it's, it's very important. The life that we found around found around us and the life that we live and the people that of course we also influence. Yeah. Um, in the course of also that one year that we're talking about uh, soft ski, we also touched about something important, which I found in one of your projects, which have to do with purpose, the reason. Because if you don't know, what, okay, now let me let me just tell you one, one thing. You see, mm -hmm. uh, you see a lot of some immigrant, no, because I've worked in this sector for a long time, so it, it's for me it's very important. Also because I'm an immigrant here in Italy, so it, yeah. the lack of immigrant for me is key. Yeah. Now, you see somebody who passed through nearly sacrificing his or her life in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. Sea, in the Sahara Desert, and then you manage to get to Italy, and you have to struggle to get the paper, and now you eventually got the paper, and you go and start wasting your life around. Now, the question is, why? Because why did you even have to come here in the first place? If you don't know... <laughs> because... When you have to sac nearly sacrifice your life to for what for what reason? Mm. So that leads me also to the question I want to ask you, which is purposeful living. Some people I see around they don't live on purpose; they live on bubble. You know, this is what is happening. They just jump in. This is what the society are saying. They just do that. Okay, today is red, so everybody is red. Tomorrow is black, everybody is black. But you. What color really is yours? Like, mm -hmm. what is your point of view? Like, where are you going? What is your destination? Why are you yeah. here? So help me understand the importance of purposeful living. How do we manage to live on purpose? You see, for me, I think living on purpose is taking ownership, taking responsibility. It goes back to being a self-leader. It goes back to making choices that move my life forward. And I think to, to live on purpose, I need to know who I am. I need to know my values. If I don't know my values, say, for example, if one of my values is freedom, and I know that freedom is really important to me, I am going to live my life on purpose such that I don't get into trouble and get locked up in prison. And so knowing me would allow me to make choices that are aligned with my values. And that is what purpose is all about. Purpose is all about making choices that align with your values. And so many of us do not know our values. We want to become rich because we've been sold. As we grew up back home in Africa, we were sold this story that when you become rich, you become happy. The ultimate for people is to become happy. And because we have been conditioned either culturally, by the media, by whatever, I don't even know, We've been conditioned that riches bring equals happiness. And so this person who comes to Europe or traveling to Europe equals happiness. This person who comes to Europe, who travels to Europe, they come to Europe and think that, okay, I have arrived. They live in that euphoria for a few months, maybe weeks or even days. And then they start asking themselves, is this it? Where is the happiness that you sold me that when I come to Europe, I'm going to become happy? And as a consequence, they become disgruntled. They, they lose hope. They become overwhelmed. They become frustrated. And as a result of that frustration, they give up on themselves. Now, it takes a really powerful mindset for someone to travel and find out that actually that's not the happiness I was looking out for. 
and then change the course of their lives. It takes someone with a really powerful mindset. And I think for me, that is where I come in. That is the work that I love to do. Because when I then come in with that idea of actually, happiness is not money. What is it that makes you happy? Let's, let's, let's look deep into this. Who are you as a person? Is it fulfillment that you're looking for? What fulfills you then? Most of my clients that I work with, they realize that, oh, it wasn't actually that job. I thought when I have this job, I'll be happy. I thought when I travel to Italy, I'll be happy. I thought when I have a new car, I thought when I have 1,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds, I'll be happy. But it's not it. Our happiness is tied to who we fundamentally are at the core. And that is where our purpose is tied to as well. And until you actually know you at the core, it will be really difficult to know what your purpose really is. And it will be difficult to live on purpose, to live intentionally. I, I, I think you are fair. I think you are, you are just in your, in, your, in your assessment or so. That we are not like saying that if you find your purpose, if you are living on purpose, life is going to be easy, no? It's, no. They are not, no. Life is going to be difficult anyway. But you know, one thing is to live for one thing is to suffer for something. Another thing is to suffer anyway, but this time for nothing. That is that is a waste. It's a waste. Yeah. yeah. It's a waste you, of suffering. Yeah. So you must <laughs> You must you must have a target. You must know where you are going. This is very important. So that mm. if you know where you are going and you are still suffering, which are going to suffer anyway, because life basically is suffering. Life basically is that. You know, you need to just grow up to the to a point that you understand that this is how life is configured. No, that there is a lot of so there is a lot of things that are not answered. That is no template. You are going to have to figure them out yourself. Yeah. If you are there going to journey, undergo this suffering without a real deep rooted meaning, sense of sense of purpose for you, everything is, is just a waste. So your life is There's nothing. There's no point. There is no point. Yeah. All right. Now, thank you for your response. Now, I found that when I was just going through some of your work, I realized that you pay a lot of attention to uh, women of color. And also yes. beauty confident for women of color. Can you please yeah. let me understand that? Well, I'm a woman of color. <laughs> That's probably the first thing to say. But um, I, I have always had a passion for supporting women. And because I am a woman of color, I especially career women of color, women of color, entrepreneurial women of color, women of color in business, women of career women of color, those are the women that I really focus on. And it is about building confidence to take ownership of their lives, to become self-leaders. So there are so many women of color in amazing places in the, around the world, even in Africa. Yet you find that even the CEOs who are women of color, even the ones who are maybe in jobs and they know that they are deserving of promotion or they know that they are deserving of running a certain, a certain project or they know that they are, they are able to run that project yet they are not stepping up into running those projects. Why is it? Why is it that we as women of color, we are not stepping in, we're not stepping up to take the, the place that we truly know that we can, we can boss in and we, we, we deserve. Why are we not stepping up? You know, if you look at statistics of the number of women of, of color it, sat as CEOs, it will be quite low. Women in general, talk less of women of color. If you look at statistics of, I don't have those statistics, but I just know that in general, there are very few women of color who are stepping up, who feel so many women of color feel undervalued in their jobs or in their roles. So many of them feel overlooked. And it is not just enough to sit back and just feel overlooked all your life. It's not enough to feel undervalued all your life. That is why I am so passionate about supporting women of color to step up 
into roles that they know that they are capable of doing and into roles that they know that they deserve. Now, stepping into a role is not just saying, I have the degree to be able to step into this role. A degree is not enough. Those soft skills that we talked about, they are really, really useful. But also, it is somehow about knowing that I am deserving. I trust myself so that someone else can trust me. Because if you don't trust you, no one else is going to trust you. I know my worth, so someone else is going to see my worth. Because if we do not feel worthy on the inside, there is no way someone else will see that worth for us. And so I support women of color to step into, you know, that confidence to pursue the things that they know that they truly want and deserve. There are people that I've worked with that are not people of color. There are women that I've supported in their roles to take on roles of responsibility that are not women of color that they do not identify as women of color. They are not women of color, but I work with them. However, when I market myself, my passion is with women of color. Is that to say I completely leave out other people? No, absolutely not. I do also even work with organizations, teams within organization to become high performing. Now, if a team has a person of color, a man, uh, a, a white person, a black person, I'm going to work with the whole team. So that, that you know, obviously I work with women of color on one-to-one, -one, but within a group and teams, I work with whoever is in the team, to be honest. That, that's fair enough. Now, um, looking at, uh, because when I was listening to your explanation before, you, you say something like, um, that women of color are undervalued or something like that. Is it like they are actually undervalued based on your study or the fee that they are undervalued? Is that, the, is that the situation? So I don't know if you can spend a word on that. I think it's a bit of both, to be honest. It is a bit of both. I cannot say that because when I started working in the UK, I had to go through proving myself in some way. Now, um, it is not it is not written it is not written in 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 you know in plain that we undervalue you but you can sometimes feel undervalued as a result of as a consequence of what is happening within the workspace so i think in some situations women of color are undervalued and in other situations they feel undervalued However, it is not as important if you are undervalued as much as if you feel undervalued. Because me feeling undervalued means that even if I am not being undervalued, I will still feel undervalued. And therefore, I work with these women to stop being feeling undervalued so that they can then be recognized. Recognition is one thing that is very, very important in a workspace. If you work and you're not recognized, it's important in work, it's important in business, it's important in relationships. If you work and you're not being recognized, your work drops. The, right. Your performance drops. Right. But uh, if you are recognized, your performance improves. And right. so if I feel undervalued, I'm not feeling recognized, am I? Uh, the performance, no, the result at the end of the day. All right, now, Ivy, tell me, uh, looking at the, um, speaking of the people that you work with, the women that you work with uh, yeah. as your, call it, as, as students or the people that you, that you mentor, something like that, what are their concerns? What, what are their worries? Um, they are main, first, they feel frustrated. Their main worry is frustration. You know that feeling of frustration that you have when you know that one, you could be more than what you currently that what you currently are. Two, you are worth more. You can do more. You can be more. You can do more. You can have more. That feeling of frustration never goes away until you do something about it. And so, their main worry is that feeling of frustration, either in their business, 
or in their career lives or in their personal lives. And that feeling of frustration is brought about by the fact that their, their contributions are overlooked, their contributions are undervalued, the work that they do is overlooked and undervalued, and they want to, they want more for themselves. They know that they are worth more, but they are not doing more. They are not being more. They are not getting more. And so they feel frustrated. So they want to do more. Yeah. Right. When they get to that junction, no, where they mm -hmm. are supposed to get more, but they are not getting it, uh, what do you do with them? So I think the first thing is they reach out to me or I speak to them. For some of these women, it is a single conversation and then we start talking. For some of them, I reach out to them. For some of them, they reach out to me. For some of them, it's just a comment on, on social media and then I reach out. So they get to me and then what we do is I schedule a call with them and then we spend close to 90 minutes in the first sitting 90 minutes talking through what it is that they want, what it is that they are struggling with at the moment, where they would like their lives to go. We just spend that 90 minutes, first of all, get to knowing each other and talking about what it is that they really want to step into. And then after that, I tell them how I work. I tell them the length of my programs. I've got programs that last for three weeks. I've got others for three months. I've got others for six months. And then from there, if they choose to carry on working with me, they either sign on to one of those programs and then we start coaching. And we agree on, you know, uh, terms and conditions of coaching and then we start coaching. Mm, that is very important. That is absolutely important now because we are now on interpersonal basis so that the thing that we missed in school, like we were saying before, some of those soft skills because we are talking of how to deal with ourselves now. I think it was yeah. Les Brown that was saying that <laughs> the, film, the famous American motivational speaker that sometimes you need help to be able to navigate even within yourself. But sometimes we don't know ourselves enough. We don't. Since we are talking of uh, interpersonal skills or soft skill or the economy that is based on soft skill, it's very important that we need people who can help us to navigate even within ourselves. So yeah, the, the job, absolutely. I see it to be very important. But one thing I'm sort of curious about now is that have you tried to find out maybe what is going on within the women, in, the African women in UK and the African women in other parts of Europe, for example, of course, just using Europe as an example here. I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. in France or in Germany, if they are having the same issue, they're having the same worry, the same problem, or maybe they can need the same solution. I've spoken to so many women and their friends and their sisters <laughs> and their moms. And the, the, the problem seems to be a, a, a unique, uh, a universal problem for women. And I'm not just talking about women of color here. Okay. I'm talking about women in general. Now, as women of color, I would so much as to say there is an intergenerational problem when it comes to women of color. Because when you look back, we tend to be living the same patterns that our mothers lived. And they live the same patterns that their mothers lived, okay? Majority, not every woman, majority were living those patterns. And if you, if you really look back, I am tempted. Now, this is not written, any, it might be written, but I don't know. I am tempted to think that as a result of things that happened a very, very long time ago, and this dates right back to slavery, there is this conditioning that is happening amongst us as black women. We do not see ourselves through the lens of possibility. We do not really see ourselves through the lens of Yes, I can do this. And I truly believe and embody it. We say it on the surface. We say it with our mouths, but we don't believe it deep down. And I think my work comes in with digging really deep down. 
And I'm going to say for most of the women that I work with, after the first or second session, you find that they break down crying. And often it is because when you go deep beneath the surface, beneath what we say and what we put out there, you realize that fundamentally there is some, I don't want to call it brokenness, but there is some either trauma or there is some, some conditioning that needs to be taken off, scraped off, and then relayered. There are pathways that actually need to be taken off and then new pathways laid. And until that happens, because you find that amongst women within the African community, there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of competition. And I start asking myself, why are these patterns repeating themselves? It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It is the same things. But why is it? You also find that African women, we rise to a certain extent and then we stall. Why do we stall? What is it? Now, I don't have the answers, to be honest. But I'm asking questions. And those questions, it's in asking those questions that some of those women find their breakthrough. I go through your profile, some of the work that you do. And also, based on your response so far, uh, someone can see that you are really prepared for this job. And that is something really important to note, no? I, I mm. understand that you have also uh, did a study on NLP, right? Neuro yes. Linguistic Programming. Yeah. Okay. Because if we are talking of uh, uh, going deep now, those uh, techniques are very important here. I don't yeah. know if you want to or spend any time here explaining if in any way your study of NLP help you to deal with some of these challenges that you hear people talk about, if it is beneficial to you in any way possible. Oh, I honestly, it is beneficial to me. <laughs> Let me not even go to those people, okay? It is beneficial to me. Why do I say that? Because during my NLP training, I learned how to manage anxiety. Everyone has anxiety from time to time, okay? It ranges in, 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 in intensity. I learned how to manage my own stress. I learned how to manage my own anxiety. I learned how to tune into myself and give myself, you know, some compassion, some empathy, some love when I need to. I learned how to tune in and give myself a good telling off when I need to. So NLP in itself, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, it's about just being able to tune in, to understand the programs that we have that are running in our minds. As we are sat here talking, there are a lot of programs that are running on inside of our minds without us even knowing. And when you can tune in and understand the programs, then you can start to understand the patterns that you're living as a person. I understood my own patterns. And as a result of me understanding my patterns, I was then able to change those patterns. For example, one of the patterns that I used to live was you know, if someone talks to me in a certain way, I just let them be. If someone annoys me or if someone says something that even threatens, because one of my values is safety. If someone says anything or does anything that threatens my safety, I move away. And when I talk about a value, my value being safety, it doesn't even mean that I am in harm's way. It just means if someone says anything that threatens my safety on my finances, my safety on my emotional stability or anything like that, I run away. But through studying NLP, I know that it is a pattern. It is a pathway that had been laid down right from when I was young, right from when I was little. And therefore, understanding that alone allows me to be able to assert myself when the need be when the need arises. So NLP helps me to deal with stress. It helps me to deal with anxiety. And that is what I'm helping my clients now to be able to do. It helps me to strategically plan because in my study of NLP, one of the persons that we study in NLP is Disney. 
who doesn't who doesn't know about Disney? Who doesn't know about the vast work, the vast entertainment industry, Disney? But then when you look at the work that has been put in place as far as Disney is concerned, you would know that it requires a lot of planning. It requires a lot of insight. And so with NLP, you know, I was, I've been able now to use the Disney model to support my clients, to be able to imagine and to plan and to forecast their outcomes. It has been instrumental, not just to my client's life, but to my own life as a person. I'm living proof of what I am doing because I happen to be in the, you know, advantageous point of I've got other coaches as well that I am in communication with or that I am within the same space with who coach. I've got my own coach in the first place who's been coaching me over the past two years now. And then I have other coaches as well who, you know, input into my life. And then I've got courses that I do on a, on a you know, weekly or monthly basis as well. So NLP helps us to understand our programs and then to actively start to change those programs because they are not set in stone. They are not. They can change if we want to. And I think no. that is where, you mm -hmm. know, just thinking about, sorry, just thinking about that intergenerational thing that I was talking about. We don't have to say this is the way that our parents always did it or that is the way that their parents always did it. No. We can change those patterns. All right. Thank you very much. You see, this, this is very important because people need to know that there are techniques, there are ways that this thing functions. And so that is why I made mention of NLP, which is a program that you, uh, you have studied to help people yeah. understand that really there are ways that things function. Take a look, for example, of psychology. You know? I, I do make mm -hmm. this example in a couple of, um, of talk that I've done. You know? That sometimes, if you are looking at the typical African culture, sometimes mm -hmm. you don't understand that in Africa, psychology is deeply rooted in our system. But in our school, mm -hmm. we never even make mention of psychology, no? It's as nope. if we don't know. But have you forgotten those times? Maybe, for example, you have a bad dream, you go and you speak to somebody. Uh, people usually come to speak to this particular person who they ask you a series of questions that will last maybe yeah. a couple of hours. Then at the end of the day, we then prescribe something to you and then tell you, do this and do that. Okay, listen, I'm not talking of the drama in it, no, of the of the choreography. Maybe you see the yeah. person paint one eyes with chalk. <laughs> that is not really what it is, no. Those are just, okay. Now, the thing is that we need to understand that there is a pattern, that is a way that things function. Okay, mm -hmm. we're not going into those deep African traditional system now. So that NLP is one of those really uh, miraculous things. Of course, I've interviewed some couple of people who have told me about it. So that that is when you were going this way. Now I wanted you to explain about also explain a bit also how people can tap into this area because it helps mm -hmm. you to know yourself more. Because we think yeah. that we know ourselves, but no, we don't know ourselves enough. We need help to even know ourselves, yeah. talk less of the society that we live in. Okay, now let me turn yeah. the question to you like this. Mm. How did you first come to know about NLP? Um, it is through coaching because I think the 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 institution where I did my coaching training at um uh the coaching academy here in the UK, um, they are, by the way, just to say that they are one of the you know most leading coaching providers for training so um that institution they also offered nlp and when i was doing my coaching training i did not just want to be your regular life coach i wanted to to kind of base on mindset and how to support people to change their mindset so that they can change as a result of changing their mindset or their perspective they can feel empowered to live a better life for themselves so as a result of wanting to focus on mindset, NLP was naturally my next step to go to after finishing my coaching training. Because NLP, I knew that it was going to help me. I first of all did my research, of course. For anything to, to for you to in, in, indulge in any educational program, you need to do your research to see if it is going to provide, sorry, if it's going to provide you with what you need 
So I did my, my research and I found out that NLP was the way for me to have an understanding of the patterns that people leave so that I can support them to change those patterns for themselves. So that, that was my route into NLP. But having said that, how can people use it? You know, first of all, by reading. You need to read. If you don't read, if you don't, if you hear NLP in a podcast and then you go on the internet and start searching what is NLP, you're going to educate yourself. It's about educating ourselves on things that are not taught in schools because NLP is not taught in your regular school. It's not. However, there are avenues where you can read. And also, if you then read and you think that, okay, I've read this thing and I need more support, then you go and find someone to support you with it. I think that is a trajectory that we need to start adopting. Yes, I'm going to find the information. If I don't understand it, I seek help or support from someone. And guess what? Learning is a thing that is supposed to be constant in our life. Because learning, you know, like, oh, I go to school, I've gone to university, I got my certificate, I'm done with it. Oh, I got no. my degree. <laughs> <laughs> you are just starting. You are actually just starting. Yeah. All right. Now, you know, when you were explaining some of the earlier question, you may mention of the fact that, of course, when we were looking at uh, some some of our brothers and sisters who comes to Europe, and at the end of the day, they appear as if they don't have any purpose here, and they end up hmm. wasting their life. If you are not working for you, for a dream, of course, you can then be become an instrument for any person that can use you, no? Because you don't have any mission. But if you have a mission, hmm. anything that you are going to be part of or partake in, must be in line with where you are going. It's like going yeah. on a destination. You don't just yeah, jump onto absolutely. any train. The only train you are jumping into is the one that is going to, to that destination. That is yep. why it's so crucial that you know where you are going, what you represent, mm -hmm. who are you. If you don't know this, then you are even a risk. You are even at a risk to yourself. Now, yeah, absolutely. So you may mention the fact that okay, they have gotten this idea of what Europe is, this idea of what you are probably going to get. Then they come face to face to reality. Then they are confused. They don't know what to do. Yeah. So when we get to that point, what are we supposed to do? You sit back and take stock. You ask yourself, okay, I've come this far. What next? I am stuck here. What next? Why did I, first of all, come this far? Where was I heading to when I came this far? Is this where I was heading to? Okay, I've achieved my goal of getting here. That's fine. That's brilliant. But then what is the next goal? Are you going to set yourself another goal? Because we're constantly setting ourselves goals. Even if your goal is just to make it through the day, that is still a goal. So the moment you get to a place where you are, you know, you know that, okay, I'm here now. You ask yourself, what next? Where next am I going to? Once you ask yourself what next, the beauty of questions, you see, um, Tony Robbins says one thing. I cannot quote it in the same words that he says, but your answers are, de uh, uh, the, the quality of your answers are dependent on the quality of your questions. If you ask yourself, if you can ask yourself the right questions, you will always find the right answers. The question might challenge you, but if you can ask yourself the right questions, you always find the right answers. So as you get here, ask yourself, now that I've gotten here, what is next for me? Where am I heading to next? Who do I need to support me? What do I know that can support me in my next step? Who do I know that can support me in my next step? So that is about you now thinking about yourself your 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 strengths your weaknesses and your resources because humans are a resource as well so what are my strengths here where am i heading to what resources have i got where can i pull these resources from of course obviously so i think it's, uh, sorry please go please go i think it's about it's just about asking ourselves the right questions and i know that First of all, let me just talk about the schools in Cameroon. We are not taught to think beyond the exam. We're not taught to ask, ask ourselves questions outside of the exam room. 
all we go to school for is to get my degree, my certificate, and then that's it. We don't learn how to ask ourselves these questions. And it's not a cultural thing in Cameroon. I don't know about Nigeria, but in well, Cameroon, it's not a cultural say, thing. We are the same everywhere in Africa because we basically have this <laughs> colonial art. There you go. <laughs> and if you can ask yourself those challenging questions, now I often, the, the five W's, who can I, you know, how, where, what, whom, you know, those questions are really important that you're able to ask them. Because when you ask it on the surface, it's like, yeah, I asked it and I did not answer. Your subconscious mind goes to work. That's the job of the subconscious, to find answers to your questions. So ask it, leave your subconscious mind with it, you will find the answer. If you focus on it long enough and deep enough, the answers will come to you. I believe that we have the answers all inside of us. We just are not tapping into them yet. Or we're not just asking ourselves the right questions. Maybe we are not even, um, we don't even know how to ask ourselves the question. We're not aware yet. Yeah, we're not aware. We are, we are still ignorant of the fact of what we don't even know. And because we don't know that we yeah. don't know, we don't try to mm. find out because we think we know, but we don't really yeah. know. Oh, there you go. Got mm. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, this is an important part. We are moving towards the okay, towards the we are we are descending now, uh, towards the end of the podcast. All right. Yeah. Uh we have understood that retraining is a key because mm -hmm. the economy has changed. This is not yeah. only because of COVID 19. These people no. have been have been letting us know even before COVID 19 that the only possibility that you have to be able to survive the the crisis in job place, in development, the change in technology and all that is to retrain yourself. Now, mm -hmm. in the same way, you are an African who comes to Europe and you find yourself in a difficult situation. Things are changing. Of course, it's not changing only for you. It's changing even to the European themselves too. Everybody yeah. is retraining themselves. So what would you say to our fellow brothers and sisters who have got into Europe and they think this is the paradise, but they realize that no, this is no paradise. You are still going to suffer here to be able to survive. And therefore, you are going to retrain yourself in this new economy. I want you to speak to them, please. I think the thing is, why did you come here in the first place? Why did you come? Did you just come to arrive here and then that is it? Okay, granted, you probably came here just to know that, okay, I've come to Europe just like everyone else. So now that you're here, what next? What is next for you? Yeah, you have a degree back home. Your degree might be in some subject, which is brilliant. How can you use that degree? Who can you speak to? Who knows? And another thing about speaking to people is, do not just speak to your African brothers and sisters around you because they are probably in the same pot of soup as you. Because when you speak to them, they are going to tell you that, oh, man, don't even bother. I've been here like five years and nothing has happened to me. The fact that it happened to A does not mean that it is going to happen to B. Even if it happened to them, your story is unique to you. Your path is different. You get to choose your path. That is the one thing that as a people, we need to start understanding. If I am in this state that I'm in, it is because I have made the choice to be in that state. And That's I know so that somebody is going to challenge me to say, you know, no, I don't have the money to go to school. What else can you do whilst you're waiting to have the money? What else can you do? Okay, yes, I don't have the money to pay for a training, for extra training. What else can you do whilst you're waiting for that training? Who have you spoken to? What resources do you have that you can put into use before that training ever comes to life? So it's about reassessing our goals and resetting them, celebrating the little wins that we have along the way, not just sitting to wait. And I think this is one mindset that is that that I get really, really picky about, especially when it comes to to uh, my Cameroonian brothers and sisters. Now, I keep saying, I don't know about the case in Nigeria, because I know that Nigeria is slightly different from us, you know. But 
in Cameroon, it is, I want one million pounds and nothing short of that. I'm not going to think, okay, maybe I'm going to go for 10,000 first and then 20,000 and then build my way up. No, I want to get to the top and I don't want to slog it throughout the way to get to the top. That is a mindset that we have that needs to change. Every dream is a process. You start from the bottom and you work your way upwards, but you have to be patient to get to the top. If you want to go straight from bottom to top, it doesn't work that way, not for anyone. So it's all in the mindset about resetting your mindset, constantly reflecting and adjusting as you go. That is what I say. Being a self-leader is about creating your own route, constantly correcting as you go along until you get to your outcome. And if with the question of mindset again, I, you, you touch a lot of things that are really too important that if, if we really continue to treat any detail, we will spend the whole the whole day here yeah? because they are so important that anyway, it's a sign of your preparedness. You are really prepared for this job and that is so interesting. Of course, that means that we are going to be talking about this in some other time because we need to dig in detail. Also because our community need it. People need to understand this change of mentalities, of mindset yeah. that... People need to understand that there are ways things function. All right. Yeah. Now, uh, talking of mindset, talking of being able to tap into our potentials, I'm talking of how to find our power. Mm -hmm. What do you say to somebody who you know have the because it have happened to me? I know people that are really that are really one hundred times better than me. Mm -hmm. I tell them, hey, you can do it, but they don't. They, they have million excuses not to do it and i tell them hey you you got the qualification but why are you not doing it i mean when you have people like that that you know you know that they are able and they are not doing it how do you tell them to be able to find the power in them to ride on they don't know themselves that's the thing first of all i'm gonna say this might sound like, how do I put this without, <laughs> without it's, look, you, you, can, you, you, can, you can take a horse to the stream, but you cannot make it drink. You can take a horse to the stream, but you cannot make it drink. I work with horses that want to drink and that are thirsty. Shall I say any more? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are interested in the, in the sharing, you know? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I want, I, I much as I empathize with anyone who is who has got the potential and you can see it, yet they are not living up to their potential. I can support you, but I cannot make you do it. It is your choice to do it. If you choose to accept the support that I'm giving you and invest in that support, and when I talk about invest, I mean invest time, effort, and money in that support, I am going to pull the stops 100% for you. But if you choose not to do it, because we've come to an era where we do not have to baby people anymore. I'm sorry. There is no point me babying you through doing something that you clearly do not want to do, cannot be bothered to do it. If it is an issue of, Yes, this person has come to me. They want it, but they don't know how. Absolutely, I'm going to walk you through step by step by step. But if you do not want to do it, I'm not the person for you, to be honest. They say you can't save them all. And sad as it sounds, it is true. You cannot save them all. There are some people who are there for to serve as lessons for others. But I'm going to ask, are you really going to be that person who is a lesson for other people in such a way that you allow yourself to not do anything about what you want to do for someone else to learn so that they do not follow your, your footsteps? Now, how can people find your courses online? Where can they connect with you? 
Okay, so I am found on social media. I am on LinkedIn as Ivy Ngwa. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I think that is the best place to find me, LinkedIn. I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. I am also on Facebook as Ivy Ngwa still. And I am on Instagram as Ivy, on this, Ivy Rose underscore coaching. So you can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Then you can also visit my website, which is www.ivyrosecoaching.co.uk. That is my website. Or you can email me at ivyrosecorner at gmail.com. Absolutely important. That's great. Now, uh, what would be your final statement? Because we are coming to the end of the podcast today for today's conversation but we really do have a lot to talk about that made for next time so what would be your final statement because we really have talked about a different thing today uh from where you are coming from to your uh, engagement with the community to our people you know and we have spoken passionately about it so how would you like to, to conclude it i think i just want to say that as um as a people we are capable of more we are capable of more in terms of our personal lives we're capable of more in career in our career lives we're capable of more in business we're capable of more in general everywhere but we just need to step into that capability and how do we make that transition we make that transition by embracing change we make that transition by embracing a shift in perspective. And that is a change pretty much. And if you are not able, if you cannot really shift that perspective by yourself, there are some people who can totally rock it and do it. But if you cannot shift that perspective by yourself, then seek support. Seek support. I am here to support anyone who wants to shift that perspective so that they can step into their power because we are a powerful people i believe that right deep with it and i'm not just saying that i truly truly embody and believe it we are people who are powerful we've got a lot of potential we can do above and beyond we don't need to keep holding ourselves back thank you so much yeah. i really i really appreciate it i thank appreciate you. it if you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead Ewafo. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.